Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind a abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 126 of the Mixology Talk podcast, and this week we're talking to bartender and author Michael Lamont about his new book, The Imbible, um, and also get some of his insights into starting a craft movement in a small town. Um, he's got some great insights, and I definitely recommend checking out his book, The Imbible. Um, it's got some great photos, got some great cocktails, and I really love his approach on cocktail design. It's very simple, but very, very effective, so definitely check that out, and uh Stay tuned for the podcast. So this week, I'm really excited to have uh, Michael Lamone uh, on our podcast. Hopefully, I said that last name right. I know I have a tendency to butcher last names, um, but I'm uh, really, really happy to have him on um, Mixology Talk. So thanks for joining us, Micah. Yeah. Hey, how's it going, man? Good, man. Did I get the, the last name correct or uh, did I butcher uh, it? Yeah, it's it's Lamon. It's <laughs> it's tricky. Anglicization well, of a French word that was anglified and then re-Frenchified, so now it's re-anglicized. It's real confusing. <laughs> well, I apologize for butchering the words, but uh, definitely thank you for uh, for joining us, man. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Micah is a um, bartender extraordinaire up in uh, Virginia. Um, he's got a lot of cool stuff happening, um, has a heirloom garden uh, that he utilizes uh, in the cocktail program, uh, and most importantly, just came out with a book. Um, would you mind talking about kind of your background, some things that interest you, yeah. and uh, the book that you just wrote? Yeah, so um, I, I have kind of a weird perspective on, on alcohol and booze because I, I grew up in a, a teetotaling household. And uh, none of my parents drank, none of my family drank, and uh, I didn't really taste alcohol until I was 21. Oh, um, wow. I got a, I had had this uh, job that I got at a, a country club with a bunch of buddies of mine, and we were just kind of these goof off, uh, skillless bar, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 bus boys. <laughs> And every once in a while, the country club would have big events, and we got repurposed as uh, banquet bartenders. Uh huh. And it it was you know is total comic thing to have all these like teetotaling, uh, you know, evangelical kids like pouring cocktails for you know uh, you know all these old money white country club folk. Uh, we had absolutely no idea what we're doing. And we were very, very confused by what was going on. <laughs> like, why are these people like drinking this stuff? Why are they acting so weird after they have five or six glasses of wine? Anyways, um, so uh, me and my buddies thought thought booze tasted so terrible, and we wanted to know how to make it taste good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of like a question that I've been trying to answer for the past almost twenty years. Like, how do you how do you make a balanced cocktail? Uh, how do you how do you balance the the aggressive flavor of of alcohol? Sure. So so uh, so the book that I wrote really uh, tried to uh, uh, address that, and it's kind of a gift to uh, a twenty year old version of myself, someone who's who's totally unfamiliar with alcohol, someone who's just very baffled by you know what is vermouth, you know, what's the difference between vodka and whiskey, you know how do you how do you structure a, a, a cocktail? How do you how do you make an original cocktail? So um, it's very much a, a, a book that's oriented towards uh, beginning and kind of home home bartenders. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I gave it a read um, before our uh, our interview here, and I can't recommend it enough. Um, if you've struggled with creating your own cocktails in the past, um, this will definitely answer a lot of your questions. Um, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about it was how you simplified that whole process and you came down to two cocktail families. Um, can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, just to kind of zoom out just a little bit more, um, uh, there's kind of three necessary components uh, that you need for a balanced cocktail. You need, uh, 
you need a spirit base, you need to sweeten it, and then you need to balance that sweetened base with something either assertively uh, bitter or something assertively acidic, or in some cases, a little of both. Mm -hmm. uh, so both of these uh, uh, cocktail families, we've got the two main techniques that you use to execute cocktails are you shake them or you stir them. And so uh, most shaken cocktails uh, incorporate some kind of fruit juice or some kind of thicker ingredients. Uh, stirred cocktails are usually mostly spirits and vermouths and, and things like that. And so the way that I think about, uh, you know, building new cocktails is I want to start from kind of a basic recipe and then just kind of go from there. So for shaking cocktails, uh, I think that um, the best starting point to get to all the many uh, places you want to go uh, for shaking cocktails is starting with a daiquiri. You know, you've got a, a, a rich, uh, flavorful spirit base balanced with, with lime and sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the, the stirred cocktail family, I think of the Manhattan as, you know, the best starting point. You know, you can get to a Martinez, you can get to a Martini, you can get to uh, a Negroni, you can get to most most every single, uh, you know, famous classic cocktail by starting with, you know, this basic recipe and then just kind of riffing on it. So that's, so I think that, you know, most bartenders would acknowledge that, you know, whenever they're making a quote unquote uh, uh, original cocktail, they're really just riffing off of, uh, you know, a, a, a successful recipe. And that's what most, most creative people do. They start with something successful and start just kind of manipulating it, substituting like thing for like thing and, you know, seeing what happens. Yeah, absolutely. No, and, it, and you have a lot of examples in there, some beautiful photography. Um, and uh, like I said, I cannot recommend the book enough. It was really well done. Um, and just, um, if you don't mind, what's the name of the book? Uh, the Imbible. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a winking jab at at my uh, my Christian upbringing. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, and then uh, we'll have some uh, links in the show notes on where to pick up this book um, and social media and a couple other um, um, things uh, links for you as well. Um, now, one of the other reasons um, I was so excited to talk to you about, um, obviously with the book launch and all that, but you're kind of in a in a smaller market, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, it's and, great. It, okay, perfect. <laughs> no, and I think this is something um, that we get asked quite a bit um, in email and uh, through our blog is people that struggle, you know, they go, come from really big cities um, and they move into much smaller markets that don't have a craft cocktail following. And they're either trying to um, start up a craft cocktail program um, in their area um, or they, they have no idea where to start. Um, and it sounds like you've been very successful doing that in your area. I'd love to talk to you um, a little bit about how that started, um, how you got your positioning to, to make sure that the managers and owners knew that it was a good decision. Like, how did you get a craft cocktail program up off the ground uh, in a smaller market? Yeah, um, man, um... I, I think that answer is kind of, it's kind of complicated and it's kind of specific to, you know, to our area, but uh, to answer your question. Uh, so I kind of, um, I kind of came to uh, making cocktails, uh, fancy cocktails um, after a couple guys in our town had kind of broken the ice and mm -hmm. started to introduce, you know, you know, correctly made old fashions, correctly old made uh, Manhattans and, uh, and it really started to just snowball right as I was getting into it. Okay. And I was really lucky to, uh, to kind of be in the right place at the right time, uh, and, and land a, a, a gig working at a, a newly opening cocktail bar, uh, where, you know, it was just, it was really the, the planets aligning in, <laughs> in a, a spectacular way for me, uh, to, to get the job that I, I currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I had tried for a, a really long time to introduce, um, uh, you know, fancier cocktails and, and kind of homemade this, that, and the other uh, at a, a bar that I was working at. It was more like high volume. It was kind of like the singles bar. And, you know, it, it, it was met with, you know, mixed results. Sure. Some, people, some people really liked it. Uh, some people just, just didn't get it and they wanted, you know, uh, flavored vodka and soda, which that's totally fine. Uh, mm -hmm. That's easy for me to do, but um, you know, 
uh, and anybody who's, um, you know, seriously thinking about the, the, the flavors that go into a plate or into a dish or into a glass, you know, they, they want to be inspired by those things and, and be excited by them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not particularly inspired by flavored vodka. Um, no offense to flavored vodka consumers. So, um, so yeah, I think, yeah, my advice to, to people in smaller markets is, uh, uh, yeah, I think you just want to slowly introduce things that, that, that are well constructed, uh, and that are, are familiar. Sure. Um, so, um, I, I think that things like a Manhattan and a daiquiri, uh, you know, people are familiar with, you know, what that concept is. Mm -hmm. And if you execute it really, really well, um, I, I think that they'll probably hopefully come back and, and ask for it again. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, did, did that kind of touch on your Yeah, absolutely. Question? And um, actually kind of on a follow-up one, because um, I've never had to introduce um, in craft cocktail program in a smaller market. There's always been a couple of people before me. Um, but one of the things I could see um, is like you're, you're starting to push um, taste in a different direction, right? Um, because right. a lot of places are very sugar forward, um, very similar to like that, the, um, the infused vodka and soda, not even infused, but flavored uh, vodka and soda. Um, you know, the, the taste generally kind of veer off to the sweet side. And when you're talking about, you know, a balanced cocktail, a, a daiquiri in particular, um, you know, you're balancing that sweet and sour. So you're starting to drift already into a different direction uh, with, with the palate. Yeah. Um, is that something like when you served your first balanced daiquiri to somebody that usually had what is in their mind was a daiquiri. Maybe it was a lot more came, maybe came out of a bottle, um, you know, the yeah. mix or something like that. Did you have any kind of pushback on that or? No, it's usually a, a well, uh, in best case scenario, it's a eureka moment. Um, mm. so, uh, so I do cocktail classes, uh, here at the alley light where I work and uh, kind of teach people about Manhattans and daiquiris. And, and people, uh, as, as consumers and, and as people who don't work in the industry, most, most patrons, you know, they're like, well, I don't drink whiskey, or I don't drink this, or I don't drink that, or I don't drink, you know, this other thing. And so, you know, if, if you can, in a class, just like hand them an old-fashioned and be like, hey, listen, you, you don't have to drink this. You just have to learn about it. Right. And like, don't. Tell me, tell me what you do and don't like about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, chances are they have a sip and they're like, "Oh well, that's pretty balanced. That's that's pretty tasty." And next thing you know, like they drained the old fashioned, and I'm like, "Okay, well, what do you think about whiskey?" And they're like, "It's not so bad." Right. Well, you, you when you make a, a balanced cocktail, you know, you balance your ingredients. It tastes good. Uh, you know, I I don't particularly like. Uh, foie gras or sweetbreads or uh, roquefort cheese, mm -hmm. uh, but when chef makes you know, d you know, braised beef cheeks with roquefort sauce, it's it's delicious, right? You know, it's it's like this thing that I don't really particularly like, but when it's you know theoretically planned out and and well constructed and executed, it can be really tasty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like that um, the idea of um, in a small, especially how it pertains to a smaller market, the education component. Um, I think that could be really valuable because you're exposing them to it. You're getting them hands on. Um, you're like, here, try this. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you that old fashions can be a gateway drug into craft cocktails yeah. um, because they're strong, but they're sweet. Um, so it's yeah. very approachable for a lot of palates. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. I, I love that. Um, now, do you, one of the other things about being in a smaller market, um, I have worked in smaller markets, but like I said, I haven't been the first one to kind of introduce craft cocktails. Um, I always found that it was um, difficult to find people that are excited to implement your program. Um, is that something that you've struggled with or what are some of the other difficulties that you've had on the operation side of running a craft program in a smaller market? Yeah. Um, so uh, not to get too, too existential, but um, mm -hmm. You know, people aren't excited about something until they've had a really great experience with it. So I, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of bartenders in smaller markets think that uh, 
that this whole like mixology craft thing is just a lot of hocus pocus just because they've never had, uh, you know, they've never had a view carré that's been properly proportioned, technically mm -hmm. executed and, you know, served in a sexy glass in the low lit dining room and, and, you know, experience the magic of a really, really delicious cocktail in a, in a nice setting. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, when people experience that, um, it really changes, uh, you know, their whole disposition towards that. Mm -hmm. so, so part of, part of uh, my job is, is, is to convince people that, um, you know, there's this thing out there that's, you know, part of American gastronomy. It's part of, you know, our, our tradition uh, as, you know, as, as Americans making, making food and drink uh, that is worth pursuing. Uh, mm -hmm. that it can be transcendentally delicious when done properly and uh, that they can, they can master that if, you know, you're willing to put in the work. Yeah. I think that it, it, it first starts with them having an, like a, a eureka moment themselves where they're like, Holy shit, this is, this is delicious. <laughs> so, so that's kind of, uh, I, I, I encourage people to, to taste things and, you know, you know, like have a straw of this, have a straw of this, you know, taste stuff, uh, you know, get excited about what you're doing, get curious about what you're doing, get, you know, you don't, you don't like Calvados, taste this, you know, mm -hmm. and chances are they'll get excited about it after, you know, having a good iteration of it. Yeah, absolutely. I remember my first introduction into fine dining. Um, one of my training um, steps was to actually come in and have dinner as yeah. a guest. I, they brought me in. They said, bring a friend. Um, they took care of everything. And, um, you know, it was just the opportunity to see how operations run from a guest perspective. And I think for me, um, that really solidified my understanding of hospitality as it pertained to this particular restaurant and what we're trying to deliver to our guests. Um, and after that, you know, I was hook, line, and sinker all in um, and excited about the program and excited where we were going. So exposing being exposed to it from the consumer end. Um, yeah, it's very different. Really good. Mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely helps get some perspective. And I, I always encourage people uh, to, I'm like, hey, come in, like have some cocktails, eat some plates, you know, see, see what makes your job magical and like right. get, get a new perspective on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's really important, especially if you're, you're operating a, a an, an establishment or a bar program that's kind of outside the norm where people are a little bit uncomfortable with it, you know, with that information and knowledge. Um, I think that getting the guest perspective and, and seeing those aha moments of like, Oh, I get it. Um, you know, they're doing something that's just not being done in this market. I I'm totally cool with this. I can totally get behind it. And it just kind of drives the education and, and the passion um, even further than it, than it would if they were just coming in for the money. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, any other kind of little difficulties that you were completely unaware of before you started uh, running a beverage program in your, in your, uh, in your area? Um, oh man. Uh, uh, there are so many challenges. <laughs> and we don't want to make this all about the, the hardships of running a, a beverage no. program, but I, I think there's a lot of little moments and little things that like, Oh man, I never even thought about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, one of the biggest challenges, so, uh, you know, I, I want, I want my staff to, to have, you know, this initial Eureka moment where they get excited about, you know, making balanced beverages. Uh, and, and frequently, you know, the, the people that I'm working with are new to the industry mm -hmm. or they're new to, to bartending. So, uh, you know, for me, one of the biggest challenges I have is, is training people because it's, it's not, it's not very frequent that I have, you know, a resume, you know, pop on my inbox where someone is a, a fully fledged and formed and ready to go bartender. Mm -hmm. I, I have to, you know, you know, train and cultivate, um, uh, you know, the talent that we have in the restaurant. Um, and that's a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, especially, you know, on a, on a busy night, you know, when you have to manage your workstation, but you also have to monitor somebody else's workstation, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So, 
uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's definitely a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've kind of covered some of the difficulties. I mean, um, I'm sure we can have an entire podcast just about some of the, those, uh-huh, that's weird kind of moments. Yeah. Um, but like, what are some of the benefits? Because we've talked about a, a few of those beforehand, uh, before recording this podcast. And I think there was a lot that I didn't really, um, I didn't think about and I didn't realize uh, until you explained it to me. Uh, would you mind kind of talking a little bit about some of those benefits that you have being in a smaller market versus, uh, um, I think yeah, the other one was New York that you like, oh, I couldn't, this is different from that in this regard. Yeah, um, you know, maybe this just kind of exposes me as just like a country boy, but um, mm -hmm. I I am, you know, when I go to bigger cities, um, I, I'm very uh, oriented uh, towards tastes and smells. Mm -hmm. And the tastes and smells of the city, um, they're not necessarily my favorite. <laughs> they um, sometimes aren't positive too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you know where I live, I, I have have like a, a corner lot in an old neighborhood i've got plenty of room to garden uh if if i want to be out of town and and breathe some clean mountain air it's like you know two minutes to to be in the middle of nowhere um and and for me the the ability to be around you know uh things that smell good and things that you know are beautiful uh, it really inspires my work um you know just taking a stroll through the garden and you know smell mint and lavender it's it's uh that that helps the wheels really really turn at least for me um uh yeah so charlottesville is also a really interesting town because it's it's kind of a pocket of culture that's very concentrated basically in the middle of uh you know the blue ridge mountains so you know if you venture one or two miles in any direction out of town you'll be in the middle of nowhere, um, which is great uh, for agriculture. So we've got, um, you know, I can drive up to uh, this peach orchard that's right next to Monticello and, and be there in, you know, five minutes from five to seven minutes from my house. Wow. And bring back a, you know, a half bushel of, of, you know, ripely picked peaches for service that night. Yeah, that's pretty and incredible. It's not some deal. I can drive 25 minutes out to to Crozet, you know, pick a, a a couple, you know, pints of strawberries, uh, which will be coming in shortly, mm -hmm. uh, and bring them back that night for service. So I mean, the the access that I have to, uh, you know, to to produce, uh, we've got great relationships with, uh, you know, farmers and and. Folk foragers there's a there's a guy uh, kind of eccentric guy uh, named named digger j he's been featured i think in the local palette a couple other regional food publications uh he just goes out in the woods and looks for weird things that he can sell to restaurants <laughs> so we we buy black birch from him we buy sassafras I oh buy, wow i buy ramps from him so he's got some ramps coming for me pretty soon um yeah so you know being being like this close to to the woods and to nature and to farms, um, it it really allows you to, you know, have a better appreciation of of the stuff that you're working with, and, yeah. and for me that that adds a lot of depth to, you know, my, you know, my cocktail I make with with ramp brine. It's like, yeah, I, I spent uh, hours, you know, logistically getting these ramps from this guy and cleaning them and pickling them and, and, you know, working on a recipe. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really great living in a small town and I hope I'm being an enthusiast enough for my, my food community here. Love that's it. amazing. That's really great. Um, and just being so connected to, I think that's one of the things that uh, happens in, um, in San Francisco in the area where I live is, you know, we we're fairly disconnected in general from the season uh, changes. Um, and that means, on the culinary side as well. Um, you know, there's great restaurants and everything that are really well connected with that. But in a, as a general public, we have access to fruit and vegetables all year round. Um, so not having or having 
strawberries in the middle of winter is kind of normal. They're not the best, um, right. by any means, <laughs> but you know, they're still kind of red uh, and they kind of taste like strawberries, but um, having stuff that's super fresh at yeah. the peak of their season, man, it's, there's no comparing the two. Yeah. And um, I, <laughs> I, I think I've gotten a bad Yelp review from this, but, um, but like, I, I like to use, I, I kind of feel like when you, if you use produce that's out of season, you know, and if you're really passionate about what you're giving to people, mm -hmm. you know, you don't necessarily want to serve people strawberries in, in January. Right. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, like I, I, I don't want to serve people, you know, strawberries that are totally white on the inside in January. Right. And uh, similarly, um, the, the mojito, which is the, the bet noir of the, uh, of the cocktail uh, kingdom, uh, I, I don't want to make mojitos in January. Right. The, the mint that I get from the produce company, it's, it's dead. It smells like onions. Like if you want this quintessentially minty cocktail, like come back in May when the mint is like a hundred times better. You're right. Like, <laughs> like there are a million other things that I can make for you that will be way more tasty than this like, like sad and withered, you know, mint green kind of, thing so right. so yeah i'm 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 yeah i i'm very much an enthusiast for for eating eating and drinking in season just because it's going to be way better yeah and you were mentioning something about um because this is something i've always struggled with with the beverage program is um sourcing fresh ingredients during the winter um, because you don't really have access to a lot of stuff um, but you were mentioning a couple of things that um, your forager and some of the, the local uh, farms have in their, um, in their inventory that you get a chance to work with. Um, what are a couple of ones that you typically get pretty excited about in the winter? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so I just did a podcast with, uh, with this lady, uh, Dr. Laura Carlson. Uh, mm -hmm. She runs a podcast out of, uh, I think the university of, of Toronto. Okay. It's called the feast. Anyways, she's, she's a food historian and um, I had told her about some weird things that I was working with and, and she unearthed all these interesting historical details about them. But interestingly, interestingly enough, this one orange that grows uh, wild in the woods here is called a hardy orange. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it apparently was uh, crucial in the development of the California citrus industry out your way. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Evidently, the root root stocks uh, of of navel oranges were not hardy enough, and mm -hmm. so they took these hardy orange root stocks from Virginia and, and used them to graft onto the uh, ones in California. Anyways, oh, okay. the hardy oranges are just this really weird uh, orange that grows wild in the woods. You harvest them in October and November, and uh, they're kind of difficult to work with, but they got a root flavor. Um, and I make marmalade with them. Oh, nice! So uh, we put a, a cocktail cocktail in our our winter drink list with uh, some hearty orange marmalade, some citrus, uh, some some little citrusy gin and passion fruit. It's just super super yummy. Um, so so that's one thing we worked with. Uh, birch and sassafras are another kind of cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, from what my forage guide tells me, um, uh, especially set. Sassafras roots are most fragrant uh, as the weather gets colder because the uh, plant uh, sends all of its juice down to the roots. So that's the best time to get uh, to get the most flavorful um, part of the plant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know it's it's winter, so you know you've got weird citrus. Um, you know, coming out of Florida, we make lots of marmalade. Uh, I've made marmalade with uh, with calamondins. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Calamundans made uh, some Seville orange marmalade. My my mother in law is actually uh, much better at that than I am, so I, I outsource that to her. She's really right. good at it. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's there's lots of weird weird things to play with if you just kind of kind of look around. So nice. that's that's where the the flavor is. So that's what I try to do. Perfect. No, that's great. Um, yeah, the sassafras one was the one that, that really fascinated me. Just uh, the idea of all that nutrients and all the, the good stuff going down to the roots during the winter. Um, yeah, it, it's crazy when, when he digs those things up and brings them to me. They're they're like they're orange. Oh, they're, crazy! 
Yeah, and you know, you open this bag of them and just, you know, the scent just, you know, suffuses the room. It's it's pretty cool. Oh man, that sounds great. Perfect. Um, so any other uh, benefits um, for being in the small market? I think we covered quite a few of them, but uh, anything else that kind of stands out for you? Oh, uh, um, uh, on a personal level, my, my commute, man, I, I can walk to work. It's, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I, don't, I feel like I'm rubbing it in at this point, but every, everything I need uh, for, for my work and my life is like literally within a two mile radius. And, you know, I think some people would find that self-limiting and kind of, you know, uh, wanting to explore more. But, uh, you know, we've got we've got just so much stuff that's very accessible. And, you know, I, I don't have to spend, you know, large portions of my day uh, going to and from work. So, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I think my commute was um an hour each direction um oh, plus i don't know i don't know how people do that it just stresses me out man <laughs> oh yeah no it's incredible like i i think uh when i was working daytime in the financial district uh we didn't open till 11 but i had to leave the house at seven oh. so you get a parking spot at the transit uh, station that i that i'm close to so i can get to work at eight and then i just had to hang out because if i left later um, i wouldn't have a parking spot Oh, bummer. It's impossible to get to work. So I was like, okay, well, two hours, what am I going to do today? And there was always enough to do. But um, yeah, the, the, the two minute walk is, it, that sounds nice. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> cool. Well, um, so the book in Bible, um, where can uh, people get a, get a hold of this? Yeah, um, it is, it is on, it is on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you're, don't want to facilitate the the robot overlord takeover of of Amazon and the universe. You could probably pick it up at a local bookstore. I think there are some local bookstores uh, out in San Francisco that that have it. I'm I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I'm sure they, I think like um, Omnivore is really focused on uh, culinary books. I'm um, sorry, I'd probably yeah. probably be a good spot for that. And I'm sure you can find it in a few other ones too. Yeah, and uh, I, I know that Barnes and Noble has it, um, but yeah. So if you want to do big thing, you can find it online. If but please support your your local economy and and your neighbors, and if you can buy it locally, do it. Perfect. Um, and any uh, social media or any websites um, that you want to send people to if they want to get in contact with you or um, just say hey, love the book. Uh, yeah, um, you could, so yeah, I've got just like a little basic kind of Squarespace website, uh, uh, michaelamon.com. Uh, you can send us messages. Uh, you can see little clips of videos of fun things that we've done, uh, in promotion uh, for, or for promoting the book. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the best way to, to get a hold of me or you can send me a message on Facebook. Perfect. Excellent. So we'll have links to that in the uh, show notes as well. Um, but Micah, thank you so much for your time, man. Um, and thank you for, um, all the, the, the insight into a uh, smaller markets. Um, definitely check out the book, um, at Amazon or your local bookstore, preferably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, thanks again, man. Yeah. It was nice talking to you, man. Yeah. You too. Okay. See you. So thanks again to Michael Lamone for his time uh, joining us on this podcast. His book, The Imbible, is available at your local bookstore. Um, and I really do wish this book was available when I was first starting the 10 bar. Um, his approach to cocktail design is really, really straightforward and very easy to understand. Um, and once you get that, you can kind of create endless cocktails. Uh, so like I said, I really wish his book was around um, early in my career. Uh, so check out The Imbible at your local bookstore. Now, if you're enjoying this podcast, uh, we definitely appreciate a uh, review on iTunes. Uh, it helps us reach more people, and it really makes our day when we see a good review on iTunes. Um, so we definitely appreciate that, and uh, we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future. But until then, cheers, everyone. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.